following is a presentation of the High Spot Podcast. Making their way to the ring. Talking about the world of professional wrestling. The team of Jeff Martin and the trendsetter, Brian Perga. The Jersey Wrecking Crew. What's going on, guys? You're listening to the High Spot Podcast. We are the Jersey Wrecking Crew. I am Jeff Moore, and alongside my tag team partner, the trendsetter Brian Berga. Follow us on all our social media at High Spot Podcast on Bodyslam.net and on Shining Wizards Network. Trendsetter, again, like a broken record, we are on the road to WrestleMania. What is going on, Trendsetter? How well, you it's doing? not a broken record. We have to do that. I mean, we have no physical way of you seeing us pointing to the WrestleMania sign, so we have to continually say, the road to WrestleMania. Now, Jeff, you're right. It's exciting time right now. It is WrestleMania season. It's been that way since the Royal Rumble. You guys, the crew, are listening to us weekly now, getting more amped up as we get closer and closer to Tampa Bay, Florida. And God knows I need to go to Tampa Bay right now because I, I just need that 80-degree weather is a lot nicer than here in the Northeast, guys, in Jersey slash New York. Kind of kind of need a little break, but at the same time, it's an exciting time because you you look at it from a fan standpoint. This is where all the best comes out. This is where there's there's nothing left on the table. Any surprises are going to throw out are eventually going to start employing themselves eventually here, which you've been hearing some rumors that possible things could happen. We wait as the weeks lead up into it. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're reaching, what, 40 days now? Pretty close to? Pretty close to it, Trent Center. And, first and, and we still have no place to stay in Tampa Bay. So if you guys live in Tampa Bay and listen to us, if you got a place for us to stay, let us know. And first and foremost, uh, Trent said, I want to wish the R- Ric Flair a happy birthday. Had a birthday this week. So 71 years young. And man, Ric Flair, I mean, all-time great. The man, the goat. Happy birthday. And, uh, and let's gonna, be honest. None of us a, woo! For me. Exactly. And let's be honest. None of us thought he was going to make it this far. Not for his his... You know, his legendary parting, but, you know, not too long ago, he was dealing with issues where we didn't know if he was going to make it. And yeah. that's a really scary thing to see. So to see him at 71 years young, definitely a plus if you're a wrestling fan. Really happy to see Ric Flair up and about and enjoying himself, styling, profiling into his 70s. Yes. Yeah, so happy birthday, Nature Boy. Hope you had a great week. Uh, you know, you know what? Well, if we uh, need to know, we can always confirm with Conrad. He could tell oh, us. Yeah. Dude, dude. And uh, definitely. Uh, happy for the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, trendsetter Samoa Joe mm. suspended 30 days for his first violation of the company's uh, talent wellness policy. Uh, it, it, to me, it's like a bit of bad luck because he got injured, uh, suffered a concussion is what they're reporting during a commercial shoot where he went through a table and uh, he suffered a concussion. That's what they say. And then added on to this wellness policy. Now, whether he's whether using it as maybe for him to heal up now and like listen, take your time to you know the, the latter last week of March, it's just a troubling sign because it just seems like the injuries are catching up with a guy like Samoa Joe, and it's just unfortunate because it's kind of start stop start stop start stop for Samoa Joe, and uh, man, like what, what can you say? There, it, Coulda, woulda, shoulda. His career in the WWE has kind of been cut short by injuries. And not just injuries, but a lot of starting and stopping. You know, um, He had a great run in NXT, uh, the way he was being built up there. And, and Samoa Joe, I think in certain interviews in the past, had mentioned before, Jeff, that he didn't plan on coming up to the main roster. He was perfectly content staying in NXT. And I think right now what you're seeing is you know, the way we saw him, whether it be in TNA, whether you saw him in Ring of Honor, whether you saw him anywhere, in 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 any f- promotion he was in, he was the monster. He was that 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 force that was that top guy. But when you put him in a world right now, a uh, a uh, uh, fish and now in a bigger pond in the WWE, he unfortunately gets lost in the shuffle. And and from my standpoint, I know it's really easy, guys, to you know say, oh, blame creative on this. No, it's not necessarily blaming creative, but I just don't think. Vince or anybody kind of know what to do with him because when you have the likes of a Brock Lesnar, Braun Strowman's, the Giants on Raw, where does you know Samoa Joe fit in all this? They've tried him as a heel, and you know they put him in scenarios where he's going for the title, he's faced the top babyface, he's put them over, made them better, but then how does that benefit him? You move him on to a role which I think is is you know not very natural in terms of how you interpret what a Samoa Joe is as a babyface. And you're right now, he's got to deal with injuries. He's got to deal now with the, uh, the suspension. 
and it just seems like it's just been always, especially around this time, around WrestleMania, WrestleMania time, season, yeah. this is what's happened. So I think more than just the injuries, I just think it's been a mismanagement, which we could say about a lot of talent, unfortunately, mismanagement of what do you want to do with this particular character. And, okay, one week we do this, and then the next week we do something else, and it just that inconsistency really kills any type of momentum you might have. It's been start and stop with Samoa Joe. That's going to be to me uh, since he started in the ro- since the main roster, right? Would yeah. you agree NXT he was a lot better off? Yeah, exactly. He was better off, but it's going to be defining his career in WWE on the main roster is that it's been start and stop. And plus, he's not getting any younger. He's not getting any younger, and it's due to age. But the but the but the start and stop to me is be. It is again due to injury, age is a factor, but also too, can he be reliable? So, like for example, you know he's come back and he's had that opportunity to get on the main event. He's teamed up with Kevin Owens here uh, the last couple of uh, months, and again though, it just seems like that uh, injury bug. Now, as you get older, those bones take time to heal. Uh, and also too, though, think about this though: if he were to maybe have to, you know, call it a career soon. He's always got that broadcasting career to to fall back on because he was tremendous on the mic. He always is tremendous on the mic, but him as a uh, you know TV broadcaster personality would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, as an agent, as a broadcaster, as a trainer in the Performance Center, he has options now whether he chooses to do them or not. But you're right, you know what he did for that short stint on Raw as a as a color commentator did an amazing job. He made you kind of see the the, the way the wrestler is supposed to kind of view it or in terms of really putting the performer over as opposed to you have a color guy and a baby face uh, play-by-play and they're really kind of fighting amongst themselves. When Samoa Joe did it, he really focused on the performer, the wrestler, the superstar, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I think we'd have a really successful time in broadcasting. He seems to pick it up naturally. Plus, he's got a nice, calm voice. He he He's he eloquently speaks and describes what he wants to say. Yeah, and I would love to see Unlike Samoa me. Joe. Or me. Plus, I would love to see someone Joe kind of take the spot of Jerry Lawler and kind of be that heel, but like be that smooth talking heel where, you know, you, he gets his point across, but you can also question it. Like, you know, Byron Saxon can question it. So could, uh, you know, Todd Phillips. But, uh, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens to Samoa Joe and whether he will be on that WrestleMania card because he'll, he'll come back two weeks before uh, WrestleMania. So, unfortunate news about Samoa Joe, but. Uh, how about this trendsetter? Johnny Gargano on TMZ was stating how NXT is the best brand. And kind of leading to the point where, like, if you didn't agree with that, then, you know, you're basically an idiot. So I get how good NXT the product is, you know, on paper and the quality of matches. Because I always get psyched for NXT takeovers. But, you know... You can always, as a wrestling fan, go about this and attack it this way and side with John Gargano, or you can be that person who is going to come with the facts and the numbers and say that NXT has never beaten, has only beaten AEW one time, and they tend to lose money, and they can't even draw a million people, and Raw and SmackDown still, even though you question the storylines and the ratings, they're still pulling in at least 3 million viewers, they're still putting like 3.1s, 2.8s, 2.9s. How would you attack that if Johnny Gargano makes that statement and you were either to defend or go against him? Well, Johnny Gargano is an idiot. That's not a joke. Uh, no, I love Johnny Wrestling. Um, how I view that is you, you kind of said it for me, Jeff. It, it goes both ways. You can argue with both sides, obviously. If you're passionate about NXT and what they produce as a product, then, yeah, you're going to be behind it 100%. And, and then you look at numbers and things of that nature, yeah, their, their competition with AEW on the Wednesdays. Or the mere fact that you know if they go on tour and sell in arenas, SmackDown and Raw still make better, bigger numbers than NXT. So e- either way, no, no matter how you how you attack or come come to, you know, show your argument, you're gonna have valid points. I think from Johnny's standpoint, and I could say safely, maybe for me, I'm not gonna speak for you because the last time I did that, I was in, I got in trouble. And uh, you know, for the uh, well, you're looking at me weird. I got in trouble because, again, I don't like to speak for you. I, I, you know, that's the reason why. Because um, if I say anything, it's going to be negative. But um, oh, man. when you look at the quality of what the people in NXT talk about and, and what they view it, they feel like they're, at least from my impression, I feel the people that are in NXT, and obviously it's Triple H's baby, they feel like they're more involved in the every day-to-day things, whether it's be working with agents, writers, how they want to set up a match, things of that nature. I think when you go to Raw and SmackDown Live, 
it's not that type of thing. It's more you're being told and dictated what to do. We're going to do put you, point you in this direction, in this direction. And it, 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 it's changed a little bit under Paul Heyman with Raw. They, they're kind of turning back a little bit from doing scripted promos and kind of really giving them bullet points, which is good. But again, it's going to have to learn if you haven't done it and you haven't, you know, when you initially start just doing scripted stuff. But I think when you look at it from their standpoint, they love that grind of being in it and always to be involved as opposed to the other one. So that's where I think Johnny gets his, his viewpoint. And that's where I think Tommaso Ciampa would safely say that I don't want to go to the main roster. I'd rather stay here because what's the point of going there? Most of the things that you and I have talked about when we've we've specifically talked about NXT is that, okay, what's the next call-ups? And we definitely know around WrestleMania time it's going to happen. We've seen Shayna Baszler, for an example. She's, mm-hmm. she's jumped ship now. Yeah. It's like, do you want to go up there? Because if you don't have an immediate impact and there's nothing good for you or you don't you know, grab that supposed brass ring that Vince likes to talk about, you're going to get lost in the shuffle. And then you're just basically sitting back enjoying catering and doing matches on main event and uh, – and that's it, basically. And I think that's the viewpoint where from Johnny Gargano's side. And I, I kind of agree with it. If I'm Johnny Gargano and part of the NXT roster, this is the best roster because this is the most involved. This is more intriguing. This is the more, you know, why we love, quote, unquote, professional wrestling as opposed to sports entertainment. I'm going to defend Gargano, and I'm going to say this, that he's allowed to have his own opinion. He should take pride in his brand which is great because obviously they've invested a lot of their time in NXT product in the uh, black and gold, and that's fine, and um, I'm all for that. Um, he should say, though, that that is the the wrestling brand because Raw and SmackDown are going to be also known as that entertainment brand, sports entertainment brand. So if you want, kind of wants to differentiate and think that, hey, we're the better brand because we're the, we're the wrestling brand, right? Uh, that's good too. But well, in you... fairness, I think he already implies that, mm-hmm. you know, because they want to separate the brands. They want it to be, it's all under the WWE umbrella, but they want NXT to be its own identity. But when you're the brand that's put up to go up against AEW and you've only won one ratings battle and, the, you know, again, the numbers, you don't even draw a million viewers, right, on Wednesday nights, to me... People are going to combat you on that. And they're going to go, oh, really? Especially the AW fan. Who, when he hears that, they're going to go, oh, really, Johnny Gargano, Johnny Wrestling? Let's take a look at the ratings. Let's take a look at the uh, the shares. Let's look, take a look at the demographic between 18 and 49. So that, to me, is where Johnny Gargano, if you're going to go show the numbers, it's kind of not true. But I don't blame Johnny Gargano for feeling that way because it is pride in your brand. And more wrestlers should have that. So if you're an NXT guy, you should feel that way. If you're a Raw guy, SmackDown guy, AW guy, you got to believe that your brand is the better brand now i don't know if i would call you an idiot or it's stupid if you think the other way because your opinion kind of you know it's your opinion and no one should tell you otherwise but uh you know it's just interesting take for gargano though to be so uh out and about about his feelings on on nxt so uh it's gonna be interesting to see can nxt eventually come anywhere near aw and that's gonna be uh, a key factor heading into the next couple of uh, months, so we will see what happens. AEW Revolution is this Saturday. Uh, you're going to get Cody versus MJF, and I was wanted to tell you this, Trendsetter, and everyone wonders why AEW still beats NXT, and we're going to have an interview with Randy Hogan for Monday um, as he will be in New York City. Uh, for D365 promotions in uh, at the big event. And it's all about relatability, man, and, and, and character and storytelling. And right now, AEW probably has the best storyteller, and that is Cody. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, and I think in terms of storyline base-wise, yeah, I think that's something, in my opinion, they have to rely on a little bit because if I look at them from a talent roster pool, and I've said this before on several shows, although they do have talent, I don't think it's deep talent where... A lot of these guys still have to establish themselves, and they don't really don't. We don't really know who they are. You know, I suppose if you look at the NXT roster, and this is where the debate goes back and forth: Why is NXT not being able to defeat AEW? Because NXT has more of the established stars. If if you were to say that, because there's a lot of guys that are really high-ranking talent on the indie circuit, and they're now in the performance center slash uh, developmental slash now NXT. But, you know, with AEW, you have the, the who's who. Like, all right, who's this guy? Who's that guy? You know, type of scenario. Not the way you would think in terms of mega stars. But I think when you have a guy like Cody, Cody has been around the business. He's been around the business his whole life. And the great thing about Cody, which, you know, most people always debate 
whether they like his in-ring style or they don't. But the one thing about Cody that you'll never be able to match or uh, or fault him on is his ability to uh, garner emotion from a crowd. And I told you this when I saw him when we had he had the lashes and it was pretty uncomfortable to watch sometimes. But he garnered that emotion. You felt his pain. The only other person I can think of that off the top of my head that was close to that was Shawn Michaels. When you saw Shawn Michaels in pain or he was struggling, he was going to that uphill climb from that whole you know underdog scenario. You felt it with him, and I think that's what happens with Cody, and that's why this is so intriguing. Not because, not to take anything away from MJF and the amazing work he's done as a guy that you just want to jump the guardrail and just beat the crap out of him because he does it so well. But then Cody established so much because he wants to now garner revenge. Look at all he's gone through, which in reality he didn't have to go through because he could just make the match. He's a vice president. He didn't have to go through this, but shows the type of man he is to go through all this to prove a point that, listen, I'm willing to go through hell and high water, as that expression gets used a lot, to go face this little uh, SOB. Type so, of thing. so get this. So I got a lot of heat on social media for saying, why doesn't Cody just make the match? He is the executive vice president. And then, of course, smart AEW fans told me because he's not a matchmaker. Tony Khan does the matches, and he is just the EVP. So I have to believe that Cody has no stroke back there where he can't get a match made done, and he has to actually face 10 lashes. So that that, that was the brushback that I received, that Cody is an EV, EVP and not a matchmaker. And so that's why, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> but, you know, I'm looking forward to AEW Revolution, man. I, I really am. Uh, the uh, AEW Championship is on the line where uh, Chris Jericho and John Moxley We'll go one on one. Uh, Chris Stantlander will take on Nyla Rose, who became the AW Women's Champion uh, a couple weeks ago in Austin, Texas. So a lot of stuff going on, and uh, looking forward to just seeing it in Chicago. It's going to be a great crowd, but I'm interested to see where they go. Whether uh, Le Champion comes out victorious, or they uh, give the uh, title to, to Moxley. I mean, that's the intriguing thing, and I think to this point, still, I feel. As as cool would it be for Moxley to win the title? I'm sure there'd be an uproar in Chicago for it. I still don't think internally it's time to do that, especially with everything that Jericho's had in terms of his momentum. They just continually build it, build it to become so annoying, so irritating. You're like, come on, he's never going to lose it. And eventually, he drops the title. And I think that's just the, the best thing you do right now for uh, the company from a business standpoint. From a fan standpoint, oh, you want Moxley to win that title after after everything he's gone through. He's basically lost an eye for hmm. it. Um, and I think uh, I think even if his eye does heal up, I think he'll just keep the pirate patch because I think it's just a cool thing for him to do. Uh, he's bringing the pirate patch back. And, hey, how, dude, honestly, how much merchandise can you sell now at AEW concession stands but just by selling an eye patch? People would buy that and eat that up. That's that's money right there. I'm surprised not at already. I'm t- good, good, you know, you're welcome, AEW. But, um, yeah, give me some free tickets to the NJM Grand for double or nothing, then we'll call it even. But um, it's interesting because with every single card that they put out, I wouldn't say you look forward to every single match, but they have those staples. Jericho Moxley, it's the main event. It's what the card's being based on. They want to see that match. But then you have something that I'm pretty interested in right now is the AEW, you know, I love tag team wrestling, the AEW Tag Team Championships on the line. It's the elite versus the elite. You have yeah. the Young Bucks against um, Kenny Omega and and um, Hangman Page. And the cool thing about this is that, you know, I didn't know what to make of seeing Kenny in a tag team because you're thinking, Kenny, he's a single star. But right now they have nothing They have nothing for him to do, so it's probably the best thing for him to do. And Adam really wasn't doing much either. And they've, pre- they've gelled pretty well as a team. I mean, their finisher where they're doing the spinning Larian and the clothesline and the the V trigger. That's that's intense, and they had a great match with the Lucha Brothers. So I'm looking forward to this match because these guys. I mean, if you hate if you hate new era wrestling, you're gonna hate watching this <laughs> match. Jim but Burnett. <laughs> they, you're gonna we're gonna love it as fans because there's gonna be so many moves. You're gonna be in the edge of the seat going one, two. Oh my god! You know, it's it's gonna be amazing. I'm really looking forward to it because who knows themselves better than these guys? So to me, that's gonna be a show stealer. And then you have you know, of course. You know, the women's title that's on the line. And then you have, you know, the grudge match that people want to see. And that's the one I think that's the, that's the most emotional one. That's Cody the, and MJF. Other than Jericho and Moxley, that's another one where they really invested in the storyline-wise there. And we want to go see MJF get his ass kicked. And, and you brought the point really well, too. You said every once in a while, it's like, you don't need 12, 13, 15 matches. You need six or seven. We need those emotional ones that you know you're going to really want to look up to. And everything else is just... If it works out, it's great. 
Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, you know, it's just icing on the cake when you get mm-hmm. a, a better card. Too. Darby Allen and, and Sammy Guevara is going to be on the card, too. Sammy Guevara. So, again, going to look forward to um, what happens. And maybe we'll find out who is the leader of the Dark Order. Uh, you know, a lot of people are teasing, and I, I believe that we're going to get the reveal on Saturday for AEW Revolution in Chicago. So definitely we'll have our eyes on that as well, too. And uh, finally, as far as AEW goes for for the week, is that Cody match with Steel Cage against Wardlow. Uh, to me, if you look at other matches like War Games, right, and they did the, it was a spot fest, and you had Ciampa go off the top land on uh on adam cole baby and then you get cody in a match where they're just you know they use the cage a little bit but the main one big spot was that moonsault and you know cody hit it thank god he hit it and um it's not worth to catch them but caught him a little <laughs> and, bit and, but that was it though yeah. it was like a textbook like you told a story that you didn't need to do all those spots. And here you have a guy like the Undertaker who talked about the storytelling, and they're talking about, well, if you do this, right, and you jump off in there, what's next? The fans are going to expect you to do over the top, and especially if there's a kick out. There was no kick out to that moonsault. That was it. That was the finisher. And to me, it was so refreshing. And that, again, is why AEW, I'm not taking my remote and switching to NXT anytime soon. It's just really that good. So that's why I'm even looking forward to to the matchup uh, on Saturday even more. Well, that just further proves my point, though, in terms of Cody and his in-ring psychology. He didn't have to do a lot of these big high spots. They call it no pun intended high spot podcast, guys. So make sure you check it out on your social media. Um, he didn't have to do that. One particular move meant everything. And the move that he did, the moonsault on top of the cage, extremely dangerous. So crazy to do that because he didn't have to. But it proved the point in terms of, one, the character of how far he's willing to go to sacrifice himself to get at MJF. And the mere fact that you said it meant something. So if we're going to end it in any in any any way we're going to end this match in any spot. We're going to end it on that spot because in the end of the day, if I'm if I'm too moonsaulting off, how high is that cage? Probably like 15 feet, 20 uh, feet? 15 plus maybe. 15, yeah. yeah. And land on somebody? <laughs> you better bet that guy's not kicking out type of thing. Uh, what, what do you think is – what match will steal the show? Uh, like I said before, I think the tag team match will steal the show yeah. for the AEW Tag yeah. Team Champ. I really think, despite anything you want to argue about the AEW Women's Championship, you want to target, you argue about the direction where you want to take the AEW Championship in, in general, the Heavyweight Championship, I think the tag team division, in my belief, has to be established and has to be the stable of AEW, at least for the first couple of years. Just because you have so much talent right now, you don't have the ability of using them all on a show, which you have Dynamite on, you have obviously AEW uh, After Dark. <laughs> A.W. Dark. I'm sorry. After Dark sounds... That's a, oh, I'm thinking about like, a completely that, different that, thing. That Again, sounds like a Trendsetter show. That's me mixing up the Adventures of the Trendsetter with, with the High Spot Podcast. I apologize, Jeff. I apologize, crew. Make sure you check that out maybe down the road for me. But, um, yeah, you have the ability of showcasing talent there, but I think that tag team division is really important because they're not spots for everybody. There is no secondary title. And if there was, I think it would be unfair to look at the roster right now and say, okay, you'll just go for the secondary title. No. I think by pitting and, and improving this tag team division will cause more people to want to watch it. I look at it for the equivalent of what was the big staple for the WCW back then? The Cruiserweights. And I think this is not a version of the Cruiserweights, but this is the version of what, you know, you're, you're, you're paying money to see Moxie and Jericho, but if you want to be entertained, you're going you're gonna to see this tag team division, you know, completely take you by storm. Yeah, most definitely. And by the time this comes out, uh, what about you? Which match is going to steal the show for you? Uh, I just, I, I just love the story, and I'm looking forward to Cody MJF. Okay, and cool. I think that the story won't end there. I think that they've done such a good job that it won't culminate, but it'll just be the the beginning of a long term feud between these two. You got to do it. You can't just have a blow off on this one because there's so much, so much. It's so personal here. Mm-hmm. So I think that we will see a carryover and it'll lead to a long term feud. But I'm looking forward to how that's going to develop though. The first time they get in the ring. And Trendsetter, uh, by the time this comes out, uh, there's a couple of things here that we're working on. So this episode might be just a jigsaw puzzle by the time it comes out on Friday. But Super Showdown, uh, so we can't get the details, but you know we'll, we'll try and, and Trendsetter will try to scramble this as much as possible. But uh, Super Showdown, uh, by the time it comes out, it will already have been completed. It's on a Thursday, so this comes out on a Friday. We record you know, when we can here, Trendsetter. But to me, you know... Brock Lesnar's walking away with uh, 
the, the championship, I believe. I'll be stunned if it's Ricochet. So when this, you know, I predict Brock Lesnar. And, uh, and as far as anything else interesting, Goldberg and The Fiend, that to me is a big question because could Vince be thinking, if I have Goldberg and Roman Reigns at, uh, at WrestleMania, it'll do a lot better than The Fiend versus Roman Reigns because we kind of, you know, we kind of know what that's all about. So I'm going to say that that's going to be the big shocker. I think Goldberg really has the potential to walk away as the WWE champion. Yeah, I mean, um, that's the that's the one. Believe it or not, guys, is the most intriguing one. We're not really concerned about the um, the WWE championship. You're referring to the Universal title. I'm sorry. I'm with, sorry. With yeah, the, the Universal with the, championship with the Fiend yeah, and, yeah. and Brock Lesnar. I'm sorry with uh, with Goldberg. I think we're not worried about the WWE Championship. We're more concerned about where they're going to go, and it opens up a lot of, a lot of doors, man. It really does. It, you know, are are you invested enough that you've put so much time and effort into building up this fiend character? And I was the one that told you, Jeff, when I saw him standing side to side or face to face with Goldberg, I just chuckled. And this is no offense to a guy like Bray Wyatt and the amazing work he's done. But I'm sorry, but when we're looking at it from a visual standpoint, even Goldberg now at this stage in his career in life, how is this even, like, how are you even trying to, to sell this to me? Because if you're selling this to me as if the the Fiend is this dominating force similar to the Undertaker that was in his prime, or a monster like a Braun Strowman, and this is an insurmountable lot, it, it doesn't look that way to me physically from a one-on-one standpoint. And now, if you're that invested, I'd be curious to see if WWE really wants to put all their eggs and put all their chips on the table and say, you know, we're going with you, The Fiend. It'd be refreshing if they did, but then you're going to sacrifice a legend like Bill Goldberg and he's okay with it. I'm sure he'd be okay with it. I mean, it's business is business, right? But we know how protective Bill is, is of his character yeah. because it's very close to who he is. It's, it's him. So that's the interesting dynamic. And then if it does happen and Goldberg walks away, what do you do now? With all you've done and all the people you've sacrificed along the way to build up the fiend, this is what you do now. You have Goldberg to defeat him. And I know the money thing is, hey, Reigns and Goldberg, spear versus spear. That'd be pretty cool. And even during his Hall of Fame speech, Bill Goldberg's like, where's Roman? And people were cheering because you want to kind of see that. You know, the whole old school versus new school. It's, it's always going to be intriguing. They got themselves into this because they put the title on the fiend. Uh, I am the one to believe that he really didn't need that title. Yes, I agree. And that's where they've put themselves in a corner because you just said it in a nutshell. They've sacrificed all these guys, and they've even had character changes. They've had like this uh, after effect after the fiend is done with them. I mean, I mean, Seth Rollins, you know, Daniel Bryan, Finn Balor, uh, the Miz. You know what I mean? Like um, Finn Balor, Finn Balor, <laughs> and it just has this change on them. So that huge investment in the character could just go poof up in smoke yeah. if you give the title to Goldberg. But I get their they're wanting to see Goldberg and Roman Reigns, but it's at the cost of the fiend, and that's to me a head scratch. How many well, times man. has that happened to Bray Wyatt? Oh, I know. How many times? It started with him losing since, to John Cena. Yeah, since WrestleMania 30. Yeah. You've got all this memory, and you do that to him. Yeah. And then he comes back, and then you do it to him again at WrestleMania when he gets destroyed by The Rock. The whole wife gets destroyed by The Rock. Yeah. And like, yeah, time after time, the, he faced the Undertaker. The match, wow, we kind of wanted to build up. Loses to the Undertaker. Yeah. And now he has a scenario where he's 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 the champion going in against Randy Orton. He loses to Randy Orton. Like, how much more destroying can you do with this guy? He's such a creative mind. And so brilliant, in my opinion, on that. So ahead of his time in terms of how he wants to go about things. But just, it frustrates me. I mean, it would have frustrated me if I was Bray Wyatt, Jeff. Yeah. And if I put all this work in, and then this is how you do me, yeah. honestly. And and God bless him for for reinventing himself because yeah. there's a point right after that Matt Hardy you know when he tag team with him it was kind of stale he went away for a little bit and and uh, they invested in him and they trusted him enough with this with this gimmick with this with this fiend character <laughs> talking about Matt gonna, Hardy yeah and then you're gonna do this and um it, it just it's just weird but again that's their doing for putting the strap on him because you saw money signs dollar bills where you know what he really didn't need it. He really didn't need that. He didn't need it. At least not yet. If you wanted to do it in the future, but man, it was and just like you it was just said like, it. It was just the cash cow. It not was just, yet. Yeah, not yet. It was just that you know. It's like going to build this, build this correctly. Exactly. In a sense. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 now they paint this little corner where you can actually see, and that's what I think is going to happen. Now you know uh, Goldberg will walk away with the Universal Championship, and the Undertaker will probably begin his feud with AJ Styles at at uh, Super Showdown. That would be amazing. That would be, and I honestly feel 
Again, this is all speculation, guys. We'll find out as, as Super Showdown Again, is yeah. done, and we'll try to put our info in this episode uh, with you guys. But this is the thing that I really feel strongly for. You know, there are rumors every single year seems to be this is the last year of The Undertaker. This is mm-hmm. last year. I feel if he goes one with AJ Styles, regardless of it, Undertaker can go over if he mm-hmm. wants to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who goes over in this, who wins. But AJ Styles, in my opinion, is the best the point can have as your final match. Because yeah, AJ yeah. is going to make you look amazing and vice versa. Both of you are going to help each other. Both of you are going to have a match. I feel that these two could have a magical moment like a Shawn Michaels slash Undertaker. That's how special it is. And again, I'm not trying to build it up and then you know <laughs> build it up so much that we had Shinsuke and AJ and then just shit the bed. Yeah. You know, we're not trying to do that. But again, there is that potential there. And that's the excitement there. And if you're Undertaker, who more would you want to work with than a guy like AJ Styles? Think about the trust that they have in AJ Styles that, you know, hey, Taker wants to work with you. And also That's a huge honor for yeah, if you're AJ, you, yeah. you got to be on cloud nine. Yeah. Wow, the Undertaker yeah. wants to work with. It. I know AJ I would. AJ Undertaker. I mean, AJ has been without a doubt a uh, an unbelievable wrestler since coming to the WWE. I hate and the right fact now, he gets overlooked too, to an extent, especially now. I mean, he yeah. had that title run for like a long time, and now he's. We really thought he was going to do something with the with the OC with the club here, but again, you know, it's they pushed him because they resigned, and then now they're back to. You know, losing singles matches and, and you know, and, and kind of like a comedic yeah. faction. You know what I mean? So, I mean, whatever. But AJ Styles stands alone to me. And uh, it's a tremendous honor. And, uh, yeah, AJ Styles and, and Undertaker, I'm down. I, w- I wouldn't reject that And if you were, were going to bring Sting back, you know who I'd want Sting to work with if he had to be safe and work one more match? AJ Styles. Yeah. Because you know that AJ would make him look like a million bucks. All right. And they've so, worked before in the past. Uh, obviously, it's going to be, to me, I would look forward to that matchup. And then closing trendsetter, because, again, this could all change on Friday, but I'm not guaranteeing and promising anything, trendsetter. Mm. But uh, Ruthless Aggression, I just want to say, what a goddamn great documentary that's been, man. Holy crap. That Evolution one was amazing. It was crazy. And, you know, getting on the Ric Flair birthday – to think that that man didn't realize he was Ric Flair when everyone else did was just him not having the confidence is absolutely one of the most shocking things. And you could see what happened with WCW, him coming in here. But, man, to see the Nature Boy Ric Flair, the greatest of all time, uh, struggling, I, I I was just completely, completely, you know, taken aback by that. But great freaking series is the Ruthless Aggression uh, documentary, man. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an it's an era that a lot of people don't really have acknowledged ever since because everybody talks about the Attitude Era. So a lot of people have acknowledged the Ruthless Aggression Era. A lot of great things that happened. We had the beginning of it. We had the whole John Cena Ruthless Aggression uh, episode, which was really good. Mm-hmm. And then we have this one too. And what I what I take back from it's not just obviously reliving our youth and knowing how old we are now, but also and I'm hey guys, I'm getting a lot of grays on my beard right now, so you know, and my hair too. So it's uh, no avoiding. I'm 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 getting I'm becoming an old man. But in that sense of being an old man, I can look back and appreciate the time that maybe because I was so pro attitude era that I probably didn't really appreciate the whole ruthless aggression era because I was so pitted on it needs to be like this. Yeah, now yeah. looking back and I'm like, oh wow, there's some pretty good stuff there. And then when you look at the whole situation of evolution, how is it developed and you know, Triple H being like literally the untouchable there in terms of he was the man. He was yeah. the Ric Flair yeah. of that time frame as well deserved. But uh you look at guys like Dave Batista, Randy Orton and you look at the fact of how much this industry, not only do you have to deal with the, the backstage politics of people mm-hmm. hating on mm-hmm. you and, and you know talking trash about you and trying to bury you, but more importantly, where like the whole paranoia lies in. What I mean by that you know, is you know, Batista getting injured, Orton getting injured, them thinking, oh, man, this is my one shot, and the pressure there is there yeah, yeah, to be before, a star. And once you've reached that point and somebody's helped yeah. you along the way, like Triple H, can you sustain it now on your own? It's like when you're a parent, right? You, know, you taught everything, you taught them everything they can. Now they have to go venture on their own. And can they sustain that? Unbelievable. Yeah, and they stuck with them. They stuck with Randy and they stuck with Batista. And mm-hmm. We had the whole issue with Jin, uh, Mark Jindrak was was, was going to take over uh, for Dave Batista for the injury wise, and and the crazy yeah. thing is, what would happen if that had been the case? Yeah. If Mark Jindrak had would it performed. I don't know. Hindsight's always twenty <laughs> twenty. But again, say if it did work, because yeah. yeah, I can't say. I, most probably, most would probably say no. It wouldn't work. Because now you're like, oh, I can't see anybody but Batista be the that yeah, guy. Yeah, but I'm sure back then nobody saw Batista. Like, oh, can Batista do this? I know. But, you know, I'm sure yeah. if you know, say it did work with Mark Jinder. 
look at it, where his career would have been. Yeah. And where, yeah. where would Dave Bautista be now? Yeah. He wouldn't be doing movies, to tell you that much right yeah. now, probably. I think he would be an intro figure in WWE television, but it's all timing. And that's, that's the intriguing thing when you watch these, these series and these episodes. Everything is about timing, and then you know, when you're given your opportunity and you take your shot, you have to make the most with it. And isn't that what it's all basically all about, guys? Making the best of your opportunities when they present themselves to you, or more importantly, when you've worked your way to gaining those opportunities. Now, we talked about the whole scenario. What would have happened if Mark Jindrak had been part of Evolution and Dave Bautista had found himself on the outside looking in due to that tricep injury? You know, Jeff and I go back and forth. I'm sure you guys go back and forth debating, looking at the episodes of the Ruthless Aggression series on the WWE Network. But what better person to ask than the man himself, Mark Jindrak, would have happened? This is a great get by Jeff. I give him all the credit in the world. I was able to get Mark Jindrak on the show, conducted a great interview with him, spoke to him about the tweet that he sent out after the uh, episode had come out where he challenged Triple H to WrestleMania, a match at WrestleMania 36 in Tampa, Florida. Wow, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Uh, and basically what we wanted to know, uh, asking the man himself, you know, the what if questions and basically has he had any closure on a scenario like this because hindsight's always twenty twenty, but you never know and now to see where Mark Jindrek is in his life too. A great interview, guys. Definitely enjoy it. I know I enjoyed listening to it and I'm sure Jeff enjoyed conducting it and a huge thanks goes out to Mark Jindrek for coming on the show and talking to us for a few minutes here. So without further ado, guys, here is Mark Jindrak on the High Spot Podcast right now. All right, the great documentary Ruthless Aggression is coming out on the WWE Network. It's actually showing that Ruthless Aggression, that great time in WWE, and it's in parts too, so you got to see the beginning, uh, and now you saw John Cena episode, and then one that just came out this week is the Evolution uh, episode and so many interesting things and someone who's going to be very integral to this whole story because uh, it's a very controversial one is uh, Mark Jindrak and he joins us here on the High Spot Podcast. Mark, how you doing today? Good, Jeff. Thank, thanks for having me on. I oh, truly appreciate it, man. So first and foremost, how were you approached about this and uh, was it uh, kind of awkward uh, reliving this uh, in front of the cameras? Uh, you know what? Uh, we filmed that. I filmed that in probably early October, I think. Um, you know, they, obviously, as everyone's seen, the, this uh, series has been excellent. I mean, this Ruthless Aggression series, I mean, people are really eating it up and stuff. So they t- took a t- couple, two, three, four months to, you know, produce it and, and do it. But they've done a wonderful job a wonderful job with it and stuff. And, uh, you know, but I filmed that in October. They just uh, called me up and they said they're looking for, you know, characters from that era of ruthless aggression that lived there you know lived lived in those moments and uh, i was one of them so i flew up to stanford one afternoon uh filmed the interview and then came back you know so uh it was weird and to be honest with you it was weird and, and at the same time going up to the you know their facilities up there the titan towers and stanford and stuff and and their you know the the other building with you they're they're filming and producing it was it was weird going back there you know uh because after, you know, when they released me in 2005, um, I had danced with coming back again, a second time with them. And then that's when Mexico kind of came into play. And I ended up choosing Mexico and the rest is history. But it was it was kind of sad to me that, I, you know, it just kind of ended abruptly. And, you know, obviously I'm a big, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I set goals for myself. And I look at the, the how my life turned out in wrestling and, and things of that sort. And I, I'm appreciative of Mexico and I had a wonderful career in Mexico, but I, I always have a kind of a what if, you know, in WWE, because I feel like when I, when I was there, I didn't, t- I had all the tools. I've, I believe that, you know, um, athletically speaking, um, just, you know, the being able to with, withstand the everyday grind, you know, and I didn't get injured very, uh, very much. Um, I just wish I could have had a better run there, you know, because I look back and it was, it was a mediocre run in my eyes, you know, at best mediocre, you know? So, um, just to talk about that era, it was, it was fun. Um, but then, you know, leaving Stanford that day, uh, I just remember kind of being a little bit sad, like, you know, almost what if, and I, I, I have very few what ifs in my life, you know, because I, anytime I, I come upon something that I want to, um, do or, or I move to, to try, I, I do it, you know, but like the, coming back to WWE after they released me in 2005, never, just never, never happened. You know, I, I found a home in Mexico and I kind of, you know, it's not, it's not broke. Don't fix it. You know, and um, what a lot of people don't know is 
um, in Mexico, you know, like I had a, you know, a, a huge career, you know, and, and not only just in the ring, but outside the ring, you know, and um, that was why it was kind of hard ever to walk away from Mexico, you know, so, uh, but yeah, but to go back to your question, it was, it was really like, it was, um, it was just, it just it was walking down memory lane when I went back there and filmed it, you know, so but I was glad they called me to be a part of it because I, I enjoyed uh, re reliving that kind of. Did it feel therapeutic for you? Did you kind of finally get the closure? I know you mentioned that in the uh, in the documentary. Yeah, the tweet, yeah. Was it? Yeah, like... By the way, that tweet. I mean, yeah, that tweet kind of. I was just joking around, kind of. Not only joking around, but I just, you know, um, just a real light. I barely even use Twitter a lot anymore, and I, you know, it's crazy how. Um, Great timing how much... there with that tweet, there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it gotten it's caught fire. Like, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've got a, a modest amount of followers. I mean, at twenty six thousand or something. But I mean, um, you know, the, the, my, some of my biggest tweets I ever put out ever. Like uh, one time, uh, fun fact: uh, the guy Jack Black played in Nacho Libre, the priest. He actually baptized my son in two thousand eighteen. Um, he's a real character in Mexico. I put that tweet out, and it got like maybe a fifteen hundred likes. And this this uh, challenge of triple H tweet went out and I think, I'm, I think it's like 6,000 likes already, like 800 retweets. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. People are eating, eating it up. It makes me wonder like the power of social media, Mark. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a great know, tool to I have, know, man. I, I mean, uh, and, yeah, and but, you... but, it, but in terms of closure, like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I, I just got, I felt a little sad, empty because, Oh, you know, I'm 42 years old now and, and I'm still, I feel I'm in wonderful shape. Um, but, you know, my, my best years have passed, you know, so, um, you know, when that happens, it doesn't matter what your mind wants to do or, you know, just your body's not going to come along with it, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I, I, it, was, it was kind of a, it was closure, um, but in therapeutic in one way, but it was, um, I don't know, the fact that I went up there and participated in it, I never had any bad feelings towards WWE, so it was it was nice to, from that standpoint, just go up there and, and at least tell my side of the story, you know, because there's so much speculation until one of these, you know, nice little doc series comes out, you know, it's, it's, you don't really don't know the truth. There's a lot of hearsay, you know, and, and I know that one picture forever been floating around the, the four, you know, that us walking over the horizon there, um, doing the vignettes and stuff for, for evolution. Um, not much was explained from that, you know, a couple blurbs by triple H in the past, you know, on the network, um, kind of saying I wasn't a good fit, but I never went into it, you know, so this finally had, people got to hear from both sides, you know, and like I said, I, I, again, I, I, I don't even, um, I don't blame them, you know, looking back, a more, um, a man filled with more wisdom and, you know, and maturity, I can look back and think, my God, that was such an idiot, you know, like, but, you know, I mean, that's just the way it was. I mean, immaturity is immaturity, but, those those rides in the car, the few days uh, we traveled with, with Flair and uh, Triple H, it was it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it was the funnest times of my life. I'm sure Orton had fun too with it too. But I mean, like, and it, the one thing I do want to say on that thing, Triple H said, you know, me and Rick, we we decided it wasn't a good fit. I, it was more it was more Triple H because that was the whole problem with those rides. You know, like Rick Flair, he's a legend. You know what I'm saying? And who didn't love stories of girls on the road and and partying and, you know, immaturity more than Ric Flair, you know what I'm saying? Because that was, that was the kind of his gimmick, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's what kind of was happening in those car rides. Like, it was Triple H was meant to have these, you know, X's and O's, let's talk chess, you know, hot tags and all these um, different um, parts of wrestling, a wrestling match. And somehow those those conversations got derailed into like, you know, what girls were meeting on the road and <laughs> hey did you ever you know hang out with that chick that night you know and stuff like that like it, it just the, the conversations just got and then you had the even the mature immaturity that which you saw in that um episode as well you know Orton and i we just goofed around it was it was it was funny it was just real funny and uh 
But you, you, know, got, but you I guys were in your, understand why. You guys were in your twenties, huh? though. I, I, you guys were in your twenties. I get the, you know how how Triple H gets it's very serious about this business. He lives and breathes it. And there's some people that maybe they they take the time and you know they try to enjoy the other things out of life. Do you feel that it just wasn't the right fit, the mesh that he was all he breathed the business, and maybe you and Randy at that time kind of were like, yeah, we love the business, but we like to enjoy other things while we're young, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, I hear old stories, you know, about the click, you know, like Kevin Nash and, and, you know, Triple H and X-Pac and stuff like that. You know, they were young one time, and, and, you know, when they had DX and back in the day, like, it was, you know, he goofed off a lot, too, you know, but I was just, you know, just just the way it turned out, you know. I mean, um, Sora and I were always doing that kind of stuff, and that was when the kind of internet was kind of just coming about, and the playing a big role in wrestling, you know what I'm saying? Like, we used to love, I mean, I don't know if people remember this, but, like, Orton and I, we staged a fight one time outside a, a restaurant in um, Boston. Um, it was, like, a favorite spot by the wrestlers after, you know, tapings or, or live events, and we staged it. We had a bunch of cops and fans outside, and we, we staged a fight, and we got, got a little internet coverage. It was, you know, so we used to we used to do stuff like that. We'd joke around and play with the internet a little bit when it was just starting, you know, when it was just getting going. And, um, you know, and in terms of just, you had some immaturity, youth, want to have fun. And, uh, that was the thing when, when Orton and I were on the road together, we, we would travel together and it'd, it'd be more than just wrestling. You know, we'd have a, a great time, you know, I mean, while other people were going from city to city in record time, I remember like Bob Holly or, you know, like a Teddy Long or someone or a couple of referees, they're just running, running on the building, get to the next city, you know, and like Orton and I came in, you know, four or five hours later, could we stop by and a restaurant and kick it for a while and, and goof around at a local Walmart or something, <laughs> just goofy stuff, man. But I mean, but it was the best times. I mean, you know, I can speak for myself. Those were like the best times of wrestling for me. Like I, I enjoyed it so much that man, yes, I, I missed out on a million dollar opportunities, but I don't know. You know, I enjoy my youth. I, 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 I can never look back at my youth and say I didn't turn it up a notch and have fun for a while, you know. So when um when the whole obviously <clears throat> they really focused on you and Randy's relationship, how did that get started? Where did you guys form that, that relationship that led into you know, into like almost being a member of evolution? What what how did you guys meet? Well, I mean, uh, we met at, in OVW uh, originally, you know, and, and, and when I when I just when WCW um, was bought by WWE, and we moved over to the um, we moved over to the um, uh, OVW. They moved us immediately to OVW. Orton was kind of getting on the road then, so we were kind of entering Louisville OVW, and he was kind of getting on the road. But then after he had that foot injury, they talked about where Bubba Dudley uh, fell on his foot. Um, he rehabbed coming back to when he was in OVW. So we just kind of gravitated and became friends. And, um, you know, we, you know, I, I talked about how much you goof around and stuff back then, and, uh, how much of a bad influence we were, we were on each other, but there was, a, um, there was good, good influence as well. You know, like I remember, um, he was the first one to kind of, uh, show me about dieting and stuff and, you know, and, and different things in the gym and vice versa. And, and it was, you know, we became friends. We just kind of went to the gym together a couple of times and had a couple of dinners, hung out. Um, and then basically after that, um, that, that out, of, out of nowhere, you know, Batista got, I think was still injured. And, and that's when kind of they're looking at me to, as a fourth, as a fourth member. So uh, just, it was just fitting, you know, we became friends and then all of a sudden they're going to put us in a group together. So it was like, you know, it was, it was awesome. So, but that's basically it. But, um, you know, I made a lot of friends with everyone down there in OVW. Um, you know, uh, so at that time, you know, in that um, episode talked about so much about all the stars that were down there. You know, the Sean Benjamins, the Charlie Hosses, Batista, Lesnar, Cena. It was it was packed. Uh, Victoria. Um, and then you get guys rehabbing and stuff from, from injuries. And uh, – I think the Godfather was down there for a while. Uh, the Heidenreich was there as well. Um, you get guys coming in now, and it was it was good times. It was it was great times, and uh, Orton as well as, as Edwin at the time. You, you know, until this day, I have a lot of strong you know friendships with all of them. You know, 
when you're getting ready to shoot that vignette, and of course, the, of course, now it's become the the famous black suit story. Did you know that they were filming uh, without you as well, or was that news to you uh, later on? Um, I did. I did not know. I didn't. I didn't know. I had no. I had no idea. I don't know. If they came back and shot it afterwards. I don't, I'm not sure, but I don't remember that. That was one thing. A lot of times, you know, they showed the old footage and stuff, which. Again, let me praise the WWE for that, that video they put together. I mean, I, who knows? I mean, my goodness, how much video footage they have, you know? Like, seeing some of that stuff just brought me back. And, uh, um, no, but uh, basically, um, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, just that part, that part sometimes, the, the, um, them shooting a second vignette and stuff, it was, it was all blur. I, I, I just... I just don't remember it, you know. I, I don't remember them shooting. So the writing was was the, the writing in the wall that I was starting to see. I didn't so much worry about the vignettes or anything like that. I was worried about on Raw they were starting to do like polls every week as that fourth member. Who's the next fourth member? They started making it like over hyping it. You know what I'm saying? So, and I knew the whole time that I was the fourth member, planned fourth member. But then it started becoming like, you know, I can hear, you know. JR or somebody who's going to be the fourth member. And then they had like even polls down to where the people could vote, you know, and um, who they thought the next, the fourth member was going to be, would it be test or Chris Jericho or so-and-so or so-and-so. And it was like, Oh my God, like it's Mark Indrak. You know what I'm saying? Do you even remember him from WCW? I was in OVW for a little while. I mean, he's overhyped. Is it going to be like a wah, 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 you know, moment? that's what I was worried about. And it, you know, that was, it, that's, I felt like that mixed in with, um, you know, I think I would have if I would have played my part better and you know relaxed and was mature enough to understand this opportunity was in front of me. I think that it would have gotten pushed through. Yeah. I think it was a mixture of the overhype mixed with you know they said you know one one weekend I'm out on the the full um, house shows or on on a loop and Orton was the student of the game with 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 Flair and. And Triple H, you know what I'm saying? And then the next week we're traveling together and we're making animal sounds and, you know, being crazy and staying out late and, you know, talking to Flair about chicks and, you know, stuff like that, you know. So it was, um, you know, it just it just happened so fast. And, and uh, but uh, I don't know. I just thought it was a mixture. I thought it was a mixture of immaturity, you know, them not being sure, them wanting Batista, uh, mixed in with, but but I, I really felt as if I would have played my part. And I was a little more mature. I would have been that student of the game that Triple H wanted in that car ride instead of a uh, a mess up. You know what I'm saying? I, I think it would have it would have gotten pushed through. I think Batista would end up joining after towards as well. You know, I think the, the the group would have been four or five strong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, um, that would have been some group there but, with all, all of you guys there. That would have been something to, to to talk about. And then, of course, they got the, the famous MSG where you're told about it. And was it Vince that came up to yeah. you and said they were going the other way? He called me. No, he called me in the office. And this is when I, I, I just, the hype was, it was so hyped up. I was like, oh, how's this going to happen? You know, is this even going to happen? Like, and then, and then that's when he called me in his office in Madison Square Garden. He told me, uh, I just feel like right now um, it, it wouldn't be good to throw you out there in the group. Um, we're going to go a different route with you. We're going to put you as a, a baby face um, in the tag team with the late Garrison Cade. And uh, that was it, basically. I mean, and, and it wasn't like when he told me, it wasn't like a, like a, you know, girlfriend breaking up with me or something. It was, I, I kind of, I expected it coming. You know what I'm saying? It was, so after he said that, it was, it was kind of like, okay, I understand, sir. You know, and basically I left, and that was it, you know. And obviously you can look back now years later and say, oh, you, it was such a huge opportunity. But you no one knows at that time what it could or couldn't have been. You know what I'm saying? There's so many characters that just fizzle, that seem like a trillion dollars and fizzle out 30 minutes later. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, the what-if game, in, you know, or the big shock factor, I see, I saw – the overhype happening on Raw. I just saw it happening. You know, polls, who's going to be the next, you know, whatever whatever the deal was back then, you know, go to WWE.com and vote or, you know, go to this number. And 
I just saw I saw that come. That's more of I I saw that being a bigger factor than you know um, so much the well it was a mixture the immaturity and the car rides and stuff was was horrible too. You know Triple H just wasn't about that at that point in his career. So um, you know so I don't know. It is what it is. You yeah, know? no, definitely. I mean, I mean, obviously, you don't know when you go there what's going to happen, and and good for you because you were, I guess, you were open to a tag team, and then and then you know you end up teaming two with Sean O'Hare, and uh, is do you think? Uh, I, I don't know how much you you knew Sean O'Hare, or how, you know, uh, or obviously you're in WCW days too as well. But like, is that is that another what if with with Sean O'Hare too? Like, man, this guy had like the look and the potential, and just you know didn't didn't click. I I, th- I think yesterday it's funny you say that I think yesterday might have been the an- anniversary of his death or maybe his birthday or something I, I don't know it was, it was I was reading it somewhere but I actually think about that a lot you know and and it was it just worked at that time you know I mean we were so green but um, I think it was it's, we were just athletic guys you know and and uh, we both had the same hunger and um, obviously those were my my real friends you know him. Uh, Palumbo, good old Stasiak, um, guys like Alan Funk, um, Elix Skipper, uh, guys like that, Johnny the Bull. Those were all of, her, all of her boys. That was our crew. You know, that was the power plant right there. And uh, especially with Sean, you know, because we like doing athletic stuff, it, it worked out together. We worked out really well together, you know. And, um, you know, and I, I know, you know, down through the years, we kind of lost touch and stuff. And, and WWE, you know, he he almost hit gold with hit that one character, you know, with um, with Roddy Piper and Hogan and stuff. Um, and those vignettes they shot, that was that was him. He was that kind of guy, you know. And uh, you know, just after that fizzled out, and you know, he eventually went his other the other way with WWE. It, it just we lost touch, you know. And uh, um, th- there's a lot of big what ifs, you know. And and uh, I look back and like one of the Biggest like underrated moves I, I think was that we used to do a double beal, a double hip toss from a guy from the floor W C W over the top rope into the ring, and it's funny like I I never see those pop up as you know you see people doing a lot of moves over the the course of time and you know, we see nowadays in in the social media age you know just those things pop up or crazy dives or dra- crazy drop kicks crazy clotheslines but. That double beal was like pretty impressive, you know what I'm saying? We we actually took it another level afterwards. O'Hare and I would, I think it was it might have been Alan Funk, Queewee, we double or maybe Jamie Noble, we double hip toss him over the top ropes, and Sanders was in the ring, caught him and power slam him. You know, like wow. that was, yeah. I don't know, but just o- O'Hare and I, our our um, styles were very similar, you know, yeah. and uh, but I miss him, man. You know, I, there's. Those guys, Kerry Garrison, Kate as well. You know, um, it sucks. My a lot of my ex partners are not even here anymore. You know, um, and, uh, it, it, it's it's tough because uh, you know it's you always think of what, what's the last you know thing you talked about. What's you know, and a lot of times it's you know you don't know what's the last time you know. And but in wrestling, you know, guys go their separate ways. You're with them every day, hanging out, going to the gym, eating breakfast, um, um, and then the next day. You know that someone gets released, or somebody gets changed from Raw to SmackDown, and then they get released, or you know, it just and you never see them again. You know, but in terms of O'Hare, yeah, but that that's always a what if as well. You know, when you guys got the word that uh, WWF, WC, um, WWF, WWE bought WCW, um, just you know, do you remember where you were? Were you worried? Were you nervous? Uh, just your thoughts about that when you found out. No, I wasn't. I wasn't nervous. Um, I just, you know, I knew I was green, green as shit. You know, like I knew I was really green. Um, but in terms of body, athleticism, that that look, you know, for a while, you know, you have to understand in the '90s and even early 2000s, WWE was still, WWF was still land of the giants. You know what I'm saying? The Kevin Nashes, the Sid Vicious, the the Undertakers, Kane. You know, and um. It's what Vince until, loves, you know. You know? Until, yeah, this is what Vince loves. So I wasn't, you know, when the whole thing was going down. In fact, in Panama City, when Shane McMahon spoke on WCW television and they did the whole thing, I was actually, um, I had a dark 
a dark match, the first match of the night on that show against Jason Jett, I believe. And um, and that, that was the, just in the locker room was just crazy to see WWE officials, you know, that you see on TV all the time, like the Shane McMahon. And I forget who else was with him, but <clears throat> somebody else he just, you know, recognizable characters you've seen on WWE television before. I guess, I guess Bruce Pritchard, just, I guess, was there too, right? Bruce, yeah, like yeah. that or somebody, yeah, or Briscoe yeah. or somebody uh-huh. or, you know, or somebody, you know, one of those agents or whatever, yeah. but um, I was never scared, you know, and um, we 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 weren't part of that, that WCW money gravy train either, you know what I'm saying? So it was like um, it, we, were, we were making more money than we've ever made before, but at the same time, it wasn't like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars where oh, we're going to go from that to zero tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? I, I felt confident. I felt confident, you know? And I felt, to be honest with you, I felt that was part of the reason why WCW kind of folded was because, um, you know, it had you know, all these high-dollar contracted guys that their work rate is not what it used to be. You know, maybe it was they're milking a little bit, you know, and... and and plus, they had creative. A lot. Think, they had a lot of creative control too, right? That was an, another yeah, issue as well. Yeah, yeah. So just you know, so when they threw out the all of all like natural born thrillers on television, the Mike Sanders, the you know, there's all these new characters, and we get criticized a lot for being green, and you know, but it was it was it was needed because like WWE, WWF, that was, that was that changing time. The names right there. Um, they basically had all these guys: the Kurt Angles, the the Rocks, the um, the tests, you know, all those guys coming out of um, Sky Duhati and and um, what was his name, Brian Christopher, coming out of the school, you know, that were just excellent, excellent workers, you know, with almost like a, it wasn't quite the OVW class that I was in, but they, well, they had quite a class too, come out all at the same time, you know, like all these young stars, hungry stars, you know, and, um, you know, that was, the natural born thrillers. That was like the answer to that. But we only, you know, they, my debut on nitro with Sean O'Hare was June 26, 2000. And the reason I know that is it was my birthday, 23rd birthday, you know, June 26, 2000, it, it, that episode of when WCW, WCW was purchased was like March of 2001. I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's like literally one TV, like six to eight months. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, so a lot happened at that time, you know, um, but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't worried at all really, you know. It was a fun time actually. We're talking to you, Mark Jindrak, former WWE WCW superstar, and uh, of course we're we're gonna get to your time in uh, in Mexico in just a little bit here. I want to thank you for your time here. You can follow him on Twitter at Marco Corleone twenty three, and we think one tweet will blow up so much, Mark. I'm looking at your tweet here, and it's like in the five thousand uh, range and, and increasing here. So uh, very impressive for a guy that doesn't uh, attack the social media as much, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but um, you know. When, for example, you're, you know, obviously you're an impressive guy with some ability, with, with with a lot of ability, actually, and, you know, you just did that impressive specimen, that uh, Vince McMahon, you know, that look that you had. Um, you know, so you you obviously are now going, you know, you're, you've been released by WWE, and you're going, you know, you chose Mexico. And just talk about that. Are You, you did some New Japan, and then you, you did Mexico. Talk about the differences of styles. Talk about, like, how much you learned uh, with the Mexican style of wrestling and, 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 and the Japanese style as well. Um, well, you know, Jap- for a while there, after I was le- <clears throat> released from um, WWE, it was, I kind of was playing both sides of the fence. I was, I was going to Japan for a few weeks, two or three week tours in New Japan, and then I'd do um, CMLL for a while. Then I was doing, um, gosh, what was it, um, a, a company called Hustle in Japan. I did that for a while, like basically week tours, and then Mexico again. So I was kind of like, you know, just playing with both, see what, see what you know, uh, would fit better for me. And it ended up being Mexico, obviously. Um, so around 2006 is when I chose Mexico. But, I mean, in terms of language, um, you know, I speak fluent Spanish now. In fact, you know, I was, I've been in like 10 super big hit um, soap operas and stuff in Mexico. Um, Spanish is so much easier to learn than Japanese. Um, you know, in Mexico, you're central time, you know what I'm saying? So in terms of Eastern time, um, you're, you know, one hour behind, that's it. Um, 
it just it was it was easier. You're you're able to have a social life still, you know. I mean, just because you're in Mexico, there's still people awake when you're awake, you know. It's, in Japan, it was like flip flop, you know. Right now, it's two thirty in the afternoon or three in the afternoon, and over there it's three a.m. It's, it's people are sleeping while you're up, and you know, and vice versa. Um, so that played a lot, and in, in, in Mexico was the the first the was the the right choice because it in terms of my style, you know, the jumping, the um, you know, I didn't do any of that stuff in WWE, like jumping out of the ring or, you know, putting too much of that on display. I did like a jumping to the top rope and do like a spinning clothesline thing. But, you know, there was, I didn't do much because I kept it kind of like more physical in the ring. And, and you know, I, I found that that's really not my style. My style was more graceful. Um, I used that, utilized that ramp in Arena Mexico and see my house so wonderfully by doing like the, my move, the Eric Corleone, I would run down the ramp and just basically jump into a, a flying crossbody, uh, which was so graceful and stuff, you know, and that got me over in, in, in Mexico, you know, so it just, it just suited me so much better. You know, I, I love Michael Jordan. I'm such a basketball <laughs> fan and um, the whole Marco Corleone thing, you know, they called me the, the Italian Eagle. That was the, the Aguila Italiana in Spanish um, because that's, you know, that was flying, you know, that was my whole thing. And, uh, so in terms of style, the, the Mexican style just really suited me. You know, I mean, any fear I had of jumping over ropes or, you know, uh, it was it was done with because those guys are like cats, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, they're smaller, obviously, than the, the average Mexican luchador is probably four to five inches on average shorter and probably 40 pounds lighter than your average American wrestler. Um but, you know, like, when I got to Mexico, like, and Rey Mysterio on SmackDown, him and Eddie Guerrero were my best friends for a good span of maybe a year and a half. And, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing wrestlers like Rey Mysterio, Hoovy, um, I know guys in WCW like Blitzkrieg and, you know, these crazy um, cruiserweights. When I got to Mexico, you know, like, one show in the river Mexico, like, on the CMLL Friday night, like there's 15 guys that do do as much or more dangerous things than a Jeff Hardy in his prime. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that was the first thing I noticed. So like I was like, okay, this I can handle this. You know what I'm saying? Like how do I add my best attribute in wrestling? You know, I can say confidently, and I, I, you can quote me on this. But I had the best drop kick in the history of professional wrestling. Yeah, it was very impressive. Hands down. It, it really was Hands impressive. Down. Yeah. Yeah, you got to see it a little bit in the uh, in the documentary too. It's very impressive with the drop kicks. Um Well that was that was I took it to a new level in Mexico. Yeah. I used to have peop, two guys hold it was three on three teams, so I'd throw a guy off and my teammates would swoop in, basically uh both shoot a leg and pick him up in the air. So so guys are six feet tall, I'd have them propped up to like seven and a half feet. Um yeah. I actually yeah, but anyways, you know, like I, that was, became my style of wrestling, you know what I'm saying? And, and the athletic and jumping, the leapfrog, a compl- just a simple throw a guy off, drop down, do a leapfrog, jump as high as I could, got oohs and awesome from the crowd because, like, I would jump literally. I had a 40-plus-inch vertical, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, so you're, a little you ahead know, of, you're, you're a little ahead of your time there, Mark, because now when you see, for example, guys are oohing on over guys like Keith Lee, right? And you're, you're mm-hmm. doing stuff that, that you know, uh, that guy that he can do, and you know he's on NXT now. Mm-hmm. And he's getting all the praise and everything. So you're a little bit ahead of your time, but I guess being in Mexico, you were also able to, like to develop your character and develop uh, be more creative, have more uh, well, yeah, have more ability to you know control your own character and not kind of be the guy that maybe WWE, WWE didn't showcase, where like you said you weren't able to do all those moves and stuff. So in the end, I think that. Um, you know, the only the only issue with that is maybe time, but you know, forty two is still. I mean, AJ Styles is still wrestling at at the, you know at an older age, so you're still in your prime. And you know, I just yeah. think, I, I just think that for example, like you've like now you're coming back if you were say WWE or AW, and just just for example, right? You still have that. Mm-hmm. You've, you've you've gone to, to Japan. You you're more well rounded. You've kind of become a renaissance, renaissance man. And now you can come back, and you can. There's just a different Mark Jindrak, right? I, that's what I. That's what I'm. Different. I believe right now. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, 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 you know, and I, I'm, you know, still in good shape. And that, to be honest with you, like a lot of that um, tweet was just motivation. I've been like, um, you know, from being out of the game, you, you, 
we don't like, especially in Mexico, you know, from, apart from being a wrestler, like on TV, like I was a TV star, a celebrity on TV and I was known for my body, you know what I'm saying? So you kind of become a slave to your body and, and, you know, and then when I'm not wrestling anymore, I'm not on TV anymore. And I'm just, you know, I, I don't, it's not as much as a, you know, I don't work at it as much, you know, like I kind of get into a rut. Um, <clears throat> My 12 pack went to a six pack. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, Mark, I'm um, not gonna, I'm my, not gonna sympathize with you. Okay, I'm really not on that. Because <laughs> you, you got a six you know, pack. It, you know, it, I, yeah, yeah. So I just, you know, like lately, like I decided, like you know, spring coming up and stuff to, you know, kind of go hard and train hard. And like this was in the midst of this happening, this this documentary coming out. So I'm I'm always about using things to drive me. You know, and like Mexico, I, I believe a lot of my my success in Mexico was getting. Um, shoot up and spit out in WWE, you know, yeah. like I just couldn't understand. Um, you know, I, I know I was a, a mess up in terms of being immature and stuff, but I still felt like I was a raw athlete. You know, you could, you, you know, those, that story I told, like someone who could jump up and touch something that was 12 feet, two inches, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, on, at the Staples center, like with people watching, like that was, that's impressive. You know what I'm saying? Especially in an era, that era was still white, white boys can't jump. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. And what people don't know about this either is I got released from WWE in July 5th, 2005. At the end of July in 2005, I actually tried, I don't know if you remember the N1 mixtape tour. Okay. Oh, you, you, you oh, on ESPN. I love those. Remember the professor? Oh, the professor, was, yeah. They're on ESPN. They were like, a, it was like a modern day Harlem Globetrotters. Oh, so you had game actually, like that, Mark? Yeah, I, well, I went to the, they had an open tryout. It was funny. It was an open tryout. Um, in Atlanta, and it was crazy outside the arena. I think it was the Gwinnett Civic Center. Mm-hmm. Months previously, we had that handicap match: Luther Reigns, myself, and Kurt Angle against Big Show. And then, you know, I got released, and just a little while later, I'm outside. And the whole deal in that and one mixtape tour was to try to get in the building, to get on the TV show and play against all their stars. And not only I did I get inside the building, I won the slam dunk contest in that thing, in that gym. So 600 different guys tried out. I won the slam dunk contest in that. Wow. Uh, like, literally 20 days after I got released from WWE. So Mark Jindrak has and, got um, game, huh? That's a... And I'm actually, and this is another fun fact, I'm actually, I've, I've, I've appeared in a lot of, you know, Raw vs. SmackDown games and stuff, mm-hmm. but I'm actually in the 2006 version of An One Mixtape Tour video game. I'm a, I'm a hidden character because I'm... Um, I'm, so I'm in that video game, Mark, wow. Mark Jindrak. I, I remember mm-hmm. and one man. That was that was that was awesome, man. It was such it was such a revolutionary thing with the street ball and of course like the professor and everything like that. It, it takes me back to like my youth, man. Like I'm a really fan of and one. And man, I've got a Spanish mom, so I'm gonna have to ask her to go back to some telenovelas that you were at because this I got to see. I did not know about that uh, you were Mexican. Uh, 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 yeah, soap opera star, dude. That's, you know, yeah. and that was that was kind of like that was the kind of thing that you know I was I was happy and proud of because uh, you know like people forget like those things show on Univision over here. You know, so all the stuff I did in Mexico with a company called Televisa, when those things get done playing in Mexico is big time hit shows. I mean, most of the shows I was in were number one TV shows. One was number one for like four months in a row with like ratings of thirty one, like twenty eight, thirty, thirty ones, like ridiculous ridiculous ratings you know primetime shows but what they have what people don't understand is when those tv shows get done in mexico they get transferred over to univision here in the united states and univision is like a major player i mean you have nbc cbs you know abc fox and they have telemundo, um, telemundo, too, telemundo right? but, yeah. but but univision is also uh, a national network and uh yeah. so i get these ratings when i was in mexico i'd get these ratings and many nights the top, the variety top ten ratings of the night national television. A lot of nights I see like one night, one week, one night I saw like number one was the Major League Baseball All Star Game. Number two was some cooking reality show, and number three, uh, in this particular case, the the show was called Porque la Marmanda, and that was on Univision. Like I had like the number one, and I starred in that show. Mm-hmm. I had a number three. I was rated number three. My show was rated number three, like in in America on national uh, TV ratings. And, you know, and that, that night, particular night, uh, Modern Family was number six. And, like, Two and a Half Men was number nine or something. So, like, I look back and think, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't John Cena or or never ha- had, you know, the ability to do those things in WWE because I just had a mediocre career. But, like, all that stuff shifted over to Mexico. You know, I wrote a book in Mexico. I wrote a, bo- a book on bullying 
in Mexico and published it in Mexico. Um, I had my own fragrance in Mexico. Um, uh, you know, like I did, I was on Family Feud. I was in game shows like that. I did all the stuff that I wanted to and, and, and strive to be in WWE, but just I did it all in Mexico. You know what I'm saying? Game shows, Family and, Feud. And, uh, and I believe like you met your, your lovely wife too in Mexico too, right? And my wife, yeah. So, and, I mean, um, so what if, like, you know, the evolution story, you know, you, you see it one side, but now we're seeing the other side where, you know what, what if you were an evolution and you're touring, you wouldn't have the life that you have now. So it's... Yeah, that's, uh, that's why I said I, I, I talked to my wife about that. That's a great point. And that's, you know, you can't... And, you know, and there's so many what ifs, you know, like, remember, all the things that could happen to me, the, the good things that happened in my career, too, those, those are also what ifs, you know what I'm saying? Like... It, it, sometimes you just have to chalk it up to like, you know, depending on what you believe in, you know, if you're a Christian, you believe that this is God's will. Um, some people believe in luck, right place, right time, you know, uh, being prepared while an opportunity, you know, preparation meets opportunity, that's success, you know, uh, you know, there's so many things, but like, I can't say that like, what if I didn't evolution, I would have met my wife and I, what if I was six foot 10 instead of six, 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 you know, I would have been a power forward for the Clippers instead of, you know, Blake Griffin, you know, like all these things you, you can't. So on the what ifs, you can, on the good things, you can play what ifs as well. And, you know, I think some people don't do that, you know, like, you know, what if I never went and tried out the power plant in 1998? Yeah. I probably wouldn't have gotten to wrestling. What if I didn't, you know, what if I would have broke my leg, you know, and, you know, you know there's so many what ifs, you know, and, and I just feel like as if, as if, you know what, um, it was a fun time to reminisce about this whole, you know, Ruthless Aggression series. It's crazy what came out of it because I didn't know, like, besides what I had filmed and stuff, I didn't know what the rest was said. You know, what Randy said, what Batista said, um, what Triple H said, you know. And, and now I know, like, he basically said, no, he, he doesn't fit. Like, Vince was Vince was saying he fit. He was on your no, side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're like, what the, you know, what the fuck? You know, yeah. like, yeah. dick, you know, and, it gives you clarity. It gives you, you know, you finally find out these answers. You just kind of wish maybe Triple H would have, you know, not maybe if it was it wasn't his style, maybe or whatever. It just came up to you and was like, "Hey, man, listen, we're gonna go another way." He took me in a room and said, "Dick, fucking shape up your fucking act. Don't you see this is a million dollar opportunity? Shape up your fucking act." Yeah, yeah. I wish you would have done that. If you would have done that, then I would have woken up. You know, yeah. but well, see, then there's, there's another thing too, man. Like, okay, maybe he just. That's the thing. If he like he took Batista and Orton to the side, and he was like, you know, listen, you guys are gonna get shit on by the other guys because they're gonna hate you. Now, do you want to choose money or friendship? If he did maybe something like that with you, maybe it would have, you know, just you would have yeah. that clarity. And be like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta, you know, shape up here before they ship me out of here. But uh, yeah, uh, but just some random questions now. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Mark. No, it was, it was just interesting to see everyone's comment stores that even Batista's you know like Batista kind of spun it like his his macho way too like no that was always my spot you know like I don't believe it, I don't believe it was always his spot it was it was my spot and I lost it It was my spot to lose and I lost it he might have had his it might he might have originally been his spot but I don't think it was a, a fact of like oh there were we're actually the reason why we're not going to put Mark in the group is because we're we're waiting on Batista because that's his spot. You know, like that's bullshit. Like I that I believe that's bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like at the same time, it's easy to say 20 years, <clears throat> 17 years later, like oh Batista was the right choice. But at that point in time, when you keep tearing something, when you're a big guy like that and you keep tearing muscles, that's like a that's like a big red alert. You know what I'm saying? That's like buying a new car and the transmission goes and then. A month later, transmission goes again. You, you feel like you got a lemon, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. that, that whole, you know, Orton was straight on. He was right on. Everything he said was dead on. Triple H, I believe everything he said was dead on as well. I just didn't know it was that dead on, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, he's not a good fit. And Vince said he's a good fit. Like, it's just crazy to me, you know what I'm saying? Like, holy shit, like that, that really happened, you know? And so it's just fun to hear those reactions from everybody, you know? Yeah. Um in fact, it was fun to hear my reactions, you know, because when I do, when I filmed it, you kind of, you talk about it, but you just kind of don't remember what you said or how it came out and stuff. And they did it wonderfully. Like it came out and it, it, it gave me closure. My own hearing myself on that kind of gave myself closure, you know, and, and, and you I, didn't... I, whoever, you know, so whoever pulled the trip, whoever pulled the plug on it, which I know is triple H now, um, 
they're right in doing so, you know? Like, and I can live with that, you know? But one thing that's admirable, Mark, is that you owned up to it. You didn't blame anybody. And nope. w- w- what the wrestlers, what the fans see is that you owned up to it. You said, my bad. And you didn't go, you didn't go on, a, you know, you didn't go on social media, blasted. You didn't say, hey, this is the wrong the wrong portrayal of me, you, you owned up to it. And that's very admirable, man. I mean, it just shows the character that you are, uh, you know, and uh, I think a lot of wrestling fans see that and they're going to be like, okay, you know, he owned up to it, whatever. You know, what if he would have been in it? You know, whatever, Batista's in it. So now people were like, well, I can't imagine Mark ever being in it now because, you know, we're used to Batista, Randy, Rick, and Triple H. But now you're like, now you get yeah. your point of view. So you got your point of view now set straight. And so what I want to do is just yeah. a couple random questions for you, just like rapid fire because you've given us so much of your time already. Um, one thing you like about okay. the business now and one thing that you don't. Um, everybody has a chance. No. Where I feel is past, like I said, we talked about big guys. I felt like you had to be a certain kind of size and strength but now or a type of body or over the head over the board you know over the um top character but today like everyone the, the playing field is equal a five a guy five foot seven has just as much a chance of a seven footer and one thing and one thing that you don't like about it too much speculation on the internet yeah the dirt sheets yep yeah uh, you're you're an NBA person. What's your team, and uh, what do you? Th- I mean, well, first of all, what's your team? Um, I'm I'm really just a, I'm a LeBron fan. Okay. I want to see the Lakers win, um, especially this year, the championship. You know, yeah, yeah, especially this year. But I think uh, I've always kind of had a thing for uh, the the Mavericks, the Mavs. You know, I like I like Luca, and I just I think that team's going to be special in the next few years. So. You know, I'm I'm riding with LeBron until he he um, retires, but I think the the Mavericks are the team that's going to be tough over yeah. the next two years. And just your thoughts on uh, on AEW? Um, what are your thoughts? Do you like the product so far? And uh, you know, just <clears throat> quick thoughts on AEW. I don't I don't see a lot of it. Um, obviously, from friends that are in it and stuff. Like I'm I'm good friends with Angelico and uh, and Jack Evans. I don't even know if that's just still the names on AEW. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, but, yeah. You know, I, I see, I, I see blurbs here and there, retweets here and there, but I, I think it's cool. It's got a lot of steam. Um, it, I think the fans like it, like the product, and uh, it, like, like I, like I always, what everyone always says, competition is good, and those guys are innovators, so it's I'm good for them. I'm, I, I, I don't know really the, the box or Corey Rowe. Uh, I mean, um, what's his name? Um, do you Rhodes, like that? Um, do, you, do you like that Cody kind Rhodes, of Cody Rhodes? Yeah. Do you like that style of wrestling? Um, do you like that? Do you like the 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 comedic aspect of wrestling? Do you believe that a hey, it's like oh, Baskin yeah, Robbins? Yeah. Off, I yeah. made I made a, yeah I made a, I made a career of comedic you know uh, appealing to girls type wrestling in in Mexico you know um, so so yeah I'm I'm all about it. it depends it really I'm I'm for whatever the fans want you know sometimes the fans. There's a time for haha. There's a time for comedy. There's a time for serious shit. There's time for hardcore. There's time for extreme. You know, you know what I'm saying. So, yeah. I think there's a time that that's just like I go back to saying. You know, everybody's got an opportunity nowadays. Um, any any match is possible nowadays. You know, like it, it, it's entertainment. You know, once you get over the 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 fact that you know we really after the the red lights go off the cameras, we really aren't still punching each other in the locker rooms. You know what I'm saying like. Once people understand that um, and get into it, you know it's 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 endless possibilities, you know. So it's wonderful. Uh, and final one is you put out the tweet. We brought it up in the beginning. Now we're gonna close with this. It's got a lot of traction, and social media is amazing, you know. And I'm sh- pretty sure that if you decided to continue with this and wherever it leads to, if it ever led to a a match with Triple H. Would you do business? Yes, I would. I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way. What, what's the date today? What, February 26th? Yeah. And when's, when's WrestleMania? April, April 5th? 5th. Yep. On April 5th, if he'll face me at WrestleMania, I'll be ready. Yeah. I'll put it that way. Are you going to be in the yeah. area? Are you going to be in Tampa? Or? No. I mean, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't plan on it. You okay. know, so. no. 
but so if he says if if it were to ha- happen that you'd be open to it that's that's great man that's totally great and again it's the power of the fans if you guys want to see it if you see dollar signs in it because of this whole ruthless aggression thing and you know the wrestling fans are loyal man one thing we are is is we are loyal to the wrestlers that sh- that give us memories and we're always going to be uh always indebted to you guys so guys if you want to see that that happen get on social media and definitely let them know uh mark jindrak uh thank you so much for your time i really appreciate doing this uh and uh you know just what do you have going on right now you know tell the fans and um yeah your floor is yours no i i live in uh I'm, I'm no longer living in Mexico. I, I have a, a married for, uh, with a woman I met in Mexico. Uh, we have a three-year-old. Uh, his name is Geronimo. He was uh, baptized by Nacho Libre. <laughs> uh-huh. um, we live in Auburn, New York. We live in upstate New York, around Syracuse. So uh, go Orange. Go Syracuse Orange. And uh, basically just kind of chill every day. Just hang out with my family. And, and that's that, man. Well, Mark, if you ever got anything else on your mind, if there's any, if you just want to talk like some, you know, wrestling now, or you want to talk some NBA, definitely hit us up, man, and we'd love to talk to you again. But appreciate your time, and uh, man, best of luck to you, whatever you do, man. And man, Mark Jindrak, Triple H, now that'd be awesome, man. <laughs> let's let, let, let's let's do it. Let's do it. I'm psyched. Book, book it, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mark. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate your time. Have a good afternoon, man. Wow. And I say this all the time, but a huge thanks and appreciation goes out to Mark Jindrak. What an amazing interview. It's great to get his insights on basically what he felt like during that time and where he is now. Because, you know, when you're in that moment, as I'm sure a lot of us can relate, depending on whatever moment we're talking about, right, you're not seeing things on the outside looking in. You're just you're in that time frame. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen uh, a day, a week years from now you can only know that once it actually happens and to see where mark was at that time and now where he's kind of gotten some closure out of it and who knows you know he's, he's only 42 years old guys he keeps himself in shape he said um but he'll be the first one to admit he says his, his best years are behind him and i i kind of disagree with that to an extent granted i don't know how he feels physically but uh usually you're always hitting your prime when you're in your 40s anyway in this crazy this crazy world we love in professional wrestling but Will Triple H answer the call? Will he answer the challenge at WrestleMania for a match? Because if that's going to happen, Mark's willing to do business and he'd be ready. And that'd be pretty interesting. It'd be a pretty unique thing. You know, it doesn't look like Triple H has anything planned for WrestleMania right now, which would be the first in a, in a, in a while since we've seen that happen. It'd be pretty cool to see what, what would happen if, if those two were pitted in a match together. So only time will tell. But, Jeff, it's amazing, right? You know, it's amazing that you got Mark Jindrak on the show it was a great interview conducted. Again, I can't thank him enough for taking the time out of his day to do it. He's a busy man. He does a lot of stuff and uh, a great insight on it too. But can you imagine the mere fact that, you know, if had it if it had happened and he's there, and granted, he was in the car a lot of times with Randy, you know, driving around with Triple H and, and Ric Flair. Now, the, the amount of wealth and knowledge that he would have obtained, which, you know, ironically now, Batista and Randy Orton owe a lot to that to Triple H and Ric Flair because – that's that's a that's a pool of knowledge right there that you can't ever overlook and you can't duplicate it. Once you have that ability and that much of uh, that much of wealth in front of you, you got to take advantage of it. But think about this though, that Batista and Randy had Ric Flair and Triple H. Triple H to fall back on that wisdom. Hey, you're not doing this right. Don't do that again. You heard Triple H say, Hey, you're doing this, whatever. If you do that again, whatever, so and so happens. Like Austin didn't have that. They, hadn't, they didn't have that guy to fall back on. The Rock didn't have somebody to fall back on like that. These guys did. These guys really were very lucky the timing to have Triple H and Ric Flair there because that knowledge mm-hmm. was absolutely key in this whole thing going on. And to yeah. that too, like you mentioned, all these other guys like mm-hmm. Stone Cold and, and The Rock didn't have any of that. Mm-hmm. And look at those huge stars they became. Mm-hmm. But Dave Batista and Randy Orton had this wealth of knowledge mm-hmm. from Ric Flair and Triple H. And if you had failed... It was on you. Yeah. So how much more pressure would that have been? I have no excuse. It's like when people go to the performance center now. Mm-hmm. You know, they say you have all the tools here to be successful. If you cannot, if you're not successful here, then it's on you. Same thing with Randy Orton, Dave Batista. If they weren't successful, it was on them because there was no excuse. You're, you're 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 talking to the greatest mind in professional wrestling, Ric Flair, and basically his heir present. If that's the right word. Heir apparent. Heir apparent. There you go. Close. I was close, Ooh, guys. Nice. It's late at night. But, you know, you have Triple H, who's literally the equivalent of Ric Flair down in that day and age. There's no excuse there. But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure because I'm like, 
wow, I have here, I have all the answers. I better not fail the test. And they didn't, you know. No. So they had bumps in the road, obviously, with immaturity or just dealing with success so early. But again, they, they will, you know, the history speaks for itself. Look where they are now. And the rest, my friend, is how you say history. Uh, Trendsetter Man, great episode this week. You can follow us on all our social media at High Spot Podcast. We are on Bodyslam.net and the Shining Wizards Network on Apple Podcasts. We're on all podcast platforms. Also, check out the YouTube, subscribe, and like. Uh, you can check out all our video interviews as well as adventures with the, sh- with the Trendsetter. <laughs> With, 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 the trend say, with the stripper, because they with are the, <laughs> adventure with the trendsetter. So, I, you know, like uh, and subscribe right now. You can also check out the XFL Pod Show. Uh, follow us on Twitter at the XFL Pod Show. We're talking about the XFL recapping and previewing uh, the week uh, that was behind us and the week ahead of us in the XFL trendsetter. Well <laughs> and I know I almost messed myself up there too, trying to be so eloquent about this pod show, uh, the XFL Pod Show, which I host, and uh, hopefully trendsetter comes on again. And then one huge announcement, trendsetter, is that we will be going to Tampa and be part of the Bullet Club Beach Party. Looking forward to that, man. That was something that uh, mm. we wanted to announce today. Uh, Going to be in Tampa, and the you know, last one was was really good here at uh, Reds in uh, in New Jersey, right across MetLife Stadium, and uh, in Tampa in the sun. Beach party trendsetter. Who are you trying down. to fool, Jeff? I'm down, bro. Jeff, who are you yeah. trying to fool? In terms. There's no comparisons. We're going from New Jersey to Tampa. There's no comparison there. (laughs) See a little bit, yeah, Tampa. Well, I must say though, forward to it, yeah. Uh Yes, thank you, Randy. But I must say though, there was some, there's something about when we're in Jersey at Reds, which is a great turnout. Of something doing the interviews outdoors with that generator in the background helping us out with power and this nice little feel in terms of the dynamic of the audience and everybody around. But you could look to the side and you see MetLife Stadium. And though MetLife Stadium looks like basically just a razor blade, there's nothing special about (laughs) it in my opinion. And guys, I can say this because we're from the area, so don't worry about it. I'm not bashing on it. But just something about you just look across that highway and there's MetLife Stadium like, wow. We're going to be in line for about three hours before we get in this <laughs> building, but we're getting in regardless. Yeah. It's it's a cool feeling. So uh, I hope the same feeling we get at Tampa. I'm sure you know the the crowd's going to be excited anyway to, for the block party. And it was success time, the first when year. You look forward, you're going to see water. Yes, yeah. and some alligators and crocodiles. No yeah. alligators, no crocodiles, and some, and some beautiful women. Yes, hopefully, hopefully. Trendsetter man, great episode this week again. Though this could this could be all. Messed up by the time we get to Friday, but it'll be, oh, I'm it, counting it, it, on it'll it. be a nice surprise. Though. I am counting on it tremendously, Jeff. For my tag team partner, Jeff Martin, I'm the trend center, Brian Berger. We are the Jersey Rank Cream. You guys have been listening to the High Spot Pods podcast. Listen to us every single week. And remember, we do this for one reason and one reason only, as we inch closer to the road to WrestleMania. We do this for you, the crew. What's causing all this? You are Nate. Happy birthday. Woo!